for 10 years. I've advised clients with debt on the phone and clients with debt and depression on the phone. I've managed those teams of advisors giving that advice and now I'm an information officer. So the Money Advice Trust, which is cut off at the top. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's uh, that's okay. We run two national debt advice helplines that are free called National Deadline and Business Deadline. So we advise people with personal debts that are unmanageable and we advise small businesses with personal and business debts that are unmanageable. And the type of advice we give is self-help debt advice. So if someone calls our helpline, we will ask them about their situation and we will give them their options to deal with their debt and then we will help guide them to a decision but rather than debt management companies that generally do it all for them, we actually help them with that decision and they go off and do it. And the thinking behind that is it's a form of control because we were talking about control yeah. earlier and is it okay to say to someone who's in an unmanageable debt, it's your fault, you got into it, you got out of it. Now that's not what we do. I mean, we find a lot of clients, and we call them clients, who phone us and they've tried to phone us maybe five or ten times and they've put the phone down before they've got through to an advisor because they think we're going to judge them. They think we're going to tell them off, shout at them for being in a manageable debt and that's not what it's about. We're there to go through their options and help them make the right decision. It was interesting what was said earlier as well about if you're in debt and you've got depression, if you help manage the debt, what if you do nothing about the depression? And that's one of the things when I was reading this report that was really interesting to me because where I work, we can help manage the debt, but if someone's depressed as well, we're not going to be able to help them with that. And when I was thinking about what we need to look at going forward, I think it would be a more joined up approach. Because you can fix the debt for someone, for example, you can help them through bankruptcy, the debt's gone and gives them a fresh start. Does that mean their depression is cured? Or <coughs> probably not. Because debt might be one of the reasons why they're depressed, or it might be one of the reasons why they got into debt in the first place is because they're depressed. But if you fix one thing, it doesn't necessarily fix the other. So a joined up approach is something that we're really keen to work on. Um, I just mentioned wise advisor as well there, that's the other arm of what we do. We actually train free to client debt advisors as well across the UK. But that's basically what we do. There is still massive stigma attached to being in unmanageable debt. Um, even though it's talked about a lot more now, people still feel guilty, they still feel shameful, they still feel bad for their families. And when our clients call us, often the first thing they want to do is talk about their life story, which is reasonable and understandable. They need to get it off their chest. They might, it might be the first time they've called us. Um, it might be the first time they've spoken about this issue with anybody. They might be hiding it from their family. But one of the other things that struck me when reading this report is we have targets. We help over a quarter of a million people a year deal with unmanageable debt, but to do that we need funding. And we're funded mainly from creditors, a little bit from the government, but not as much as previous years. And to get that funding we have to promise to creditors we will deal or help as many clients as we can, and we say we aim to help this many clients this year. Unfortunately, that means we don't often have the time to listen to that life story. If we did, I think we would be able to spend more time with people and actually help more people more effectively, but we don't. Because without our funding, we can't run and the charity would close. So that's another thing I think we need to think about as well. Uh, vulnerability is a buzzword. Because I've been working in this area for 10 years now. Um, I've seen quite a few changes. Um, in the report, um, they mentioned bailiffs and debt collection agencies as being 
um, quite aggressive in their practices <coughs> and adding to people's shame and guilt and fear about unmanageable debt. Over the last 10 years, I've actually seen improvements in that, which is a good first step forward, but that's a lot more to do. <coughs> And the Financial Conduct Authority, which took over the Office of Fair Trading, I think it was last year, are very keen on the word vulnerability. And whoever they authorise, for example, charities like mine or creditors, you have to have a vulnerability policy. And within that policy, they do deem people with mental health conditions as vulnerable, quite rightly. But what they're doing is perpetuating the idea that being depressed and being in debt is someone's own personal fault and it's not to do with any external influences, which we see on the helpline day in, day out, day in, day out is not the case at all. It's lots and lots of different reasons why people are in that position. Often, um, like Sarah said, it's not because they can't manage their finances. We find people on a low income or people on benefits actually manage their finances better than anybody else because they haven't got a lot of money and it has to go a long way. Usually it is a trigger. Their car break down, breaks down, their boiler breaks down. Something happens. They haven't got the money in reserves. They have no savings at all. Uh, they borrow to get themselves out of that emergency and it spirals. So that's what happens. So to finish, I was just thinking about some of the conclusions in the report and how that um, fits in with what I do. And one of the things that was talked about was the social safety net and the austerity cuts that have happened and are happening again today. So um, I think what it does, the government's been very clever. They've, uh, it's, to me, it seems like a bit of a marketing campaign. Um, if you're in benefits, you're a bit of a loser. Like, if you're unemployed, why haven't you got a job? You must be lazy. That kind of idea is what makes people feel shameful and guilty about being in debt as well. Mm -hmm. It's about your uh, sponge on society, for example. And all these cuts in benefits is just making that worse. If you, for example, they... Um, what's the best example? Housing benefit, if you rent a property and you're not working, the government will give you money to pay your rent. But if you're in a property that they deem is too big for you, so you've got more bedrooms than you need, you might be a single person, but you've got two bedrooms, they'll cut that housing benefit and expect you to move or make up the difference. There's a complete and utter lack of social housing or even privately rented housing out there that is suitable, um, that has one bedroom. So the cuts they're making, I understand why, and I can see the other point of view, but it's not actually working in practice. Uh, the use of positive psychology. And very much so, it struck me that what we're actually doing on our helpline, what we're trying to achieve, is not blaming the individual, but it is saying if you take control of your debt, you can get out of it. And what I thought then was effectively what we're telling people is like only you can get yourself out of this. But what I hope we're doing by giving the support on the helpline because people can get as much advice as they want for free is giving them that helping hand to say although you do need to do this we will advise you every step of the way. So I agreed with what the report was saying and the Freudian principles of melancholia. And finally, making debt relief more accessible. Um, this was a big one for us because in, in October, they're making some changes to bankruptcy law and they're making some changes to something called a debt relief order. So a debt relief order is like a mini bankruptcy. At the moment, if you've got £15,000 of debt or less and you have no assets and you've got a car worth less than £1,000, you can pay £90 and have a debt relief order and after 12 months your debt's all written off which is all right quite good for a debt relief option but 15,000 pounds actually is a bit low so in October they're raising that level to 20,000 pounds now we would say that's that's an okay level of debt because there's no other options other than a debt relief order or bankruptcy that write off all your debt like that it's still not ideal um, 
one of the things that Scotland do is a debt arrangement scheme. So in England and Wales, you can have a debt management plan and that uses a third party. There's some that do it for free, some that you pay a fee for. That you pay them one payment each month, they handle all the creditors for you, all the letters, all the phone calls, and it's all paid off, sometimes over maybe 60, 70 years. Is that feasible as well, really? A debt arrangement scheme in Scotland is slightly different. What it does is it pays it off over a maximum of about 12 years. If there's some debt left over, it's written off. And within that time that you're paying, as long as you pay, all the interests and charges are frozen, their action will be taken through court, and it gives the debtors the relief that they need. So why can't they do something similar to that in England and Wales? Okay. And that's it. Good. Thank you very much, Kat. Thank you.